And church, I want to read to you what happened at Pentecost from Acts 2. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. This is the word of the Lord. See, Pentecost is this key event in the narrative of God's redemptive story. It's a big deal. Pentecost is this time where the Spirit's gift is given. You see, in the Old Testament, God dwelt in the tabernacle and then he dwelt in the temple. His presence was in a building. And people would travel to Jerusalem to experience the temple presence of God. But with Pentecost, all that changed. Now God dwells in his people. The Spirit lit the flame and the church of Christ was born. His people would now take the dwelling everywhere they went. Everywhere they stepped, they would bring the peace and the power of God. Heaven touched earth. No longer did people need to make the trek to Jerusalem to see the dwelling place of God, to see the presence of God, to see the power and the awe of God. Now he was everywhere. The light of God was expanded out. The church, the new dwelling place was with the people, not in the building. I love the ways that the, the writers of the Bible projects put it. They say now the followers of Christ become mobile temples. Mobile temples. And that's what we are. You see, the temple was like a fireplace, but Pentecost turns it into a spreading forest fire. A fire that is not controllable, and it's the kingdom of God going forth. Once it starts, it's not necessarily safe. It spreads, and every landscape that it touches, it changes. It's not controlled. Here in Acts 2 and the rest of the book of Acts, we see what happens when it's released. When the kingdom of God goes forward with its empowered people, the world will never be the same. As I prepared for this talk, I, I woke up last week, one morning, and I woke up and the Lord gave me this strange image. He gave me an image of a smoke detector. And it was a strong enough image that it got me out of bed and I felt like he wanted to say something to us as a church. And so I got out of bed and I rent, went downstairs and I realized that this vision had a challenge for us. I actually threw out all the work that I had done and began to rewrite some things to share with you today. You see, smoke detectors are cautionary tools. They're tools that help protect us. They keep us safe. They keep things as they are to be. It's a tool that alerts us when fire is near and when we're not safe. And it's, it just it gets us ready to realize that something needs to be protected and we need to put something out. The theologian N.T. Wright says this. He says, the great temptation of our current day and culture is to turn Pentecost into something safer than it is. And church, I believe that that temptation is there for us. I believe that we try to tame what Pentecost was and what it still means for us today. I think that oftentimes anything that might disrupt us as individuals, as families, as a community of believers, we want to control. We want to protect it. We want to keep the comfortability there and we want to push back. And so church, my question for us collectively today is, are we more like a smoke detector? Are we looking to contain and to protect, or are we more like the fire? Are we looking to fuel the kingdom of God going forward? Are we looking to release it? Are we looking to not try to control it, but just see what it does, to see the landscape changed? Let me ask it a different way. Are we living collectively as a church around the fireplace? Are we holding on to the safe warmth that is gathering when we get together in our church building? Or are we carrying the torch of his fire all week wherever we set foot? Because we are the church. 
See, don't get me wrong. It's incredible, and I can't wait till we get to gather again when the mobile temples of God come together to be filled, to be celebrated, but it can't be the end goal. It's not the it. It's just part of what it means for us to be the church. Pentecost is our reminder. The church is in a building. God now dwells in us. We are his church. The spirit lit the flame and the church of Christ was born. Heaven touched earth and the earth was never the same. Spirit, we are your dwelling place. Come and dwell among us, your people. Pentecost is the end of this cycle that we celebrate in our church calendar. We began with Advent and we're anticipating the coming of the Christ child. And Christmas is when we celebrate Jesus's birth. We go to, to Easter and to Good Friday, the death and then the resurrection of Jesus. We have the disciples and they have been traveling with Jesus. They're there and they're confused by his death. They're there and they experience him after his resurrection and they walk with him as he confirms who he is, as he teaches them about the kingdom of God even more. And it's in that 50 day window between the resurrection and Pentecost that Jesus gives the great commission. It's actually right before the ascension, another major event in the church calendar that he gives it. And it's this interesting time because he gives this commission to his followers but along with this commissioning comes this instruction to wait. And we read about it in Acts 1, verses 4, 5, and then verse 8. Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth. You see, Jesus' crew had their assignment. They knew their mission. It had been outlined. They had been on mission with Jesus before, and they kind of even knew what to do. They had their papers, but they weren't yet deployed. And it's a really interesting thing here that they are asked to wait. They're asked to, to just pause. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's about to happen. And they're told to stay put in the city for a time. That personally would have driven me a bit insane. I would have looked around and said, you know what kind of thing we're missing out on? This time is valuable. Let's go make something happen. I would have been probably like Peter in the story saying, let's redeem this time somehow. Let's make something happen. I imagine Peter as being the leader. And when you read through the end of Acts 1, they, they actually, Peter leads them and says, we need to at least replace Judas during this time. And, and they figure out a way and they decide on Matthias. And, and many scholars would say that maybe that wasn't a good idea. Maybe that was just them rushing in to make something happen because we never hear of Matthias again. You see, I probably would have been like Peter. But as I look and as I study what happened here, I think that this 10-day window between when they were told to wait and the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Day was this important final training that this group needed to finally realize this kingdom of God thing is happening. It gave them an opportunity to refocus. It gave them an opportunity to get the divine perspective. You see, Jesus was always talking about doing the will of the Father, and here now they are left without Jesus. And they're learning to listen, to understand, to refine their focus and know the will of the Father. It's this period of waiting that I believe taught them to look up and not look out. To look up and to not look out. You see, I find myself struggling because I'm always looking out. I'm a person that needs to achieve. I want to see what needs to be done and I want to do it. I want to develop the plan. I know my mission and I want to carry it out and get it done as quickly as possible. Producing, accomplishing, that's where I get my energy. That's where my identity is sometimes misplaced. But looking out often leads to busyness. 
that's not very productive. It often creates lists. It often lists, lists, leads to anxiety. It leads to us comparing to others. It leads to misplaced identity. And while there are times where it's a strength of mine, and there are times when it's a strength of yours, there are also times when we waste trying to make things happen. We waste our energy when God is simply trying to break through and get our attention. I think for many of us, we haven't understood yet that looking up and gaining that divine perspective is the antidote to our busyness. It's what redeems the waiting. See, many of us, we have this negative perception of waiting. It's a waste of time. But I believe that the disciples here in, in this time, they practiced the type of waiting that we read about in Psalm 37. See, in Psalm 37, it says, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Wait patiently. That doesn't excite me. But when th this is one of those passages where, you know, our English language doesn't really grasp what it's saying. When you go back to the original language, it could be translated and whirl in the dance and be in the air and focus on where you're going to land. Another way it could be translated is to focus as in giving birth. When the world becomes small and it's getting to the destination, to this one thing, it's all that matters. That's the type of active waiting that I believe the disciples learn to engage in in this 10-day window. It isn't the waiting that just waits for us to arrive at the destination. It's not my kids in the back of the car saying, are we there yet? It's not that, can we just click our heels? Can we say, beam me up, Scotty? Can we just get there? It's a different type of waiting. It's a type of waiting that I watch my son on the day that he has a basketball game. It's that kind of active waiting. When his game doesn't start till three yet, at seven o'clock, he's downstairs with his jersey on, anticipating the excitement rising. He begins to focus. He eats a good breakfast. He eats a good lunch. He starts to rehearse the plays that he's gone over that his coach has taught him in that week. He gets in the zone. He goes outside. He shoots some foul shots. He does his stretching. And so by the time tip-off comes, he is focused. He is ready to go. Church, that's what the call is for us. That's the focus that these disciples were collectively engaged in, to get the divine perception, the divine perspective, to be in the zone of what God was about to do as the kingdom expanded. That is the active waiting. That is the anticipation that they stood in. Church, Pentecost is our reminder to look up, to gain that divine perspective, to refocus, to receive his empowerment. When we do that, our world gets smaller. It gets more focused. Pentecost is the time where we take his list and make it our own, where we receive the will of the Father for our lives, because God wants to produce through us things that we can't make happen on our own. Pentecost reminds us to look up, not look out, to wait, to refine our focus. Spirit of the living God, everything else can wait. Come now and breathe upon our hearts. Hey church, this final talk is actually an invitation. It's an invitation and the main idea that I want you to take from this is, is this. Pentecost is a reminder that God desires to breathe power into our lives for his purposes. Let me try to bring all this together. You see, we are the church. We are these mobile temples that we get to gather sometimes, but then we bring the peace and the presence and the power of Christ wherever we walk, into our homes, into our apartment complexes, onto our streets, throughout our city, and some of us even into the nations. We get to do this because we've been commissioned to do this. We saw that here in Acts 1. We, we, we see this commissioning. With that commissioning comes this authority that extends to us to make disciples, to pray for peace, to pray for healing, to break injustice. But it's that commissioning, it's, it's not the full story. It's, it's not enough. And so we add to the authority and the commissioning the power that comes with the Holy Spirit in the encounter. You see, in Acts 2, we have the encounter, and the encounter brings that power. And just as the commission in Acts 1-8 extends to us as followers of Christ, so does the fact that the power extends to us. 
It's why we've seen the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. And when we walk in that power, when we add the encounter to the commission, when we add the power to the authority, things happen. The kingdom of God goes forth. And because we do that, we are these mobile temples that do have kingdom Holy Spirit power to break injustice when we see it, to lay our hands and pray for people, to pronounce blessing when we step into a new area of our city or over our own homes. And I hope you've experienced that. But with this today comes the invitation. With the gift of the Holy Spirit comes the power to walk in our commissioning. And today I believe that there are people that are going to be commissioned. You see, we know how to commission at Sam Alliance Church. We often bring people on stage and we, we put our hands out and we commission them. We commission them to be parents when we do our baby dedications. We commission teams to go out, whether it's to San Francisco, Mexico, the Middle East, or China. It's not a new concept to us. But today, I want to let you know that we leaders at Salem Alliance feel that there's a new commissioning that's at hand. We believe that a house church movement is about to launch in Salem. And we believe that many of you are going to be the leaders of it. And so the the challenge, the invitation for today is, would you, for the next four weeks, consider being a house church leader? Would you be that mobile temple? Would you be the pastor in your community? Whether it's just for your household, whether you add a friend or two to it, a roommate, maybe another family or two from your street, but would you consider being the truth, being the presence, being the power for your community over the next four weeks? Would you open your home to watch live stream with friends and family? Would you host? We ask you to do it in socially distant, appropriate ways, and we ask you to use wisdom when you do it. And some of you might not feel comfortable doing it, and we encourage you to go ahead and start a Zoom church, a Zoom small house church. But we're asking you to be more than a host. We're asking you to be the ones that ask questions when the service is done and get a discussion going. And don't worry, we'll get you the questions. We're asking you to pray and lead the times of prayer for healing. We're asking you to bring peace. We're asking you to check in with the people in your group throughout the week. And we're asking you to find provision where provision is needed for others in your group. Church, it's, it's a big call. And I know when I say this to you, many of you are, are feeling like, I, I can't do that. For many of you, you're probably feeling some, like I'm not e- equipped. It might seem a little intimidating to you. And it's those people those of you that are feeling that right now that I really want to talk to. Because oftentimes I think that's the spirit nudging you. And of course you might not feel equipped to do it. But that's what happened here at Pentecost. You see, people gathered from all over the the nations, surrounding nations. They would come to Jerusalem three times a year. And one was for the Feast of Pentecost. And so these people of these different tribes and and nations and, and languages gathered together. Many of them just pilgrims, common people that had come together to be at the dwelling place of God. And yet that's who the Spirit fell on. That's who God choose chose to use to be mobile temples to take the truth and the power and the presence of who he was back to their villages. And so our call for you is similar. Are you willing to go to the uncomfortable, to be the fire in your community, to take the presence to your neighborhood, wherever you live in this city, and to do this? Church, we believe God wants to call and breathe his power into those who are willing. Men, women, middle schoolers, high schoolers, Some of you kids in C1 and C2, we feel you're going to lead the way on this. We feel you're going to be the gatherers that grab the neighborhood kids that watch either this live stream or your own on C3 and and, and start to pray for one another and our city. But if you are willing, if you're feeling God calling you to do this, this morning I want to bless you. I want to commission you and I want to empower you and bless you with an encounter with the Holy Spirit. 
And so if that's you, if you're feeling something stir, if you're feeling that nudge, would you just put your hands out this morning while I commission you? And those of you, if you're watching with other people and there's someone that's in that posture, would you also extend your hands as we commission them? Spirit of the living God, you see those who are ready to be breathed on. You see the men, the women, the kids who have taken this posture. Lord, we commission them now in Jesus' name to be your ambassadors, to be your mobile temples. So Spirit, come. Would you give them the encounter? Would you give them a fresh revelation of your love? Would you give them a fresh revelation of who you are in your presence? Would you take just maybe some of the timid feelings away and would you replace it with confidence? Would you begin to put on their minds, on their hearts, people that they can invite? Lord, we believe you are doing something. So we commission them, we bless them with the authority that is theirs, and we add to it the power that comes in the encounter with you. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fall on them now. In Jesus' name. Church, if you had your hands out and you were just commissioned, would you mind letting me know? I'm going to put my email address here, and would you send me an email? Because I want to be in touch with you. One, I want to get you questions that you can ask that we want to resource with you. So you can just ask these questions after a live stream service. We want to track with you. We want to encourage you. We want to give you any training that you need. But would you just shoot me an email? We're pretty excited. These next four weeks, we're launching a new series on presence. We believe it's going to be powerful. We believe it's going to change lives. And we want you to join us in that and bring others in. Church Pentecost is an unbelievable celebration. It's a time when we remember that the church is in a building because God now dwells in his people. We are his church. Pentecost is this incredible reminder to look up, to take his list, to make his will ours, to avoid the busyness, to try to not make things happen on our own. And Pentecost is a reminder that God desires to breathe his power upon us for his purposes. Church, as we return to worship, we remember, we await, the Spirit's presence. Spirit, come. Show yourself to your sons and daughters. Come now. Amen. Church, thanks for being here this morning. Listen, if you're here this morning and you need prayer for something, can I encourage you to go onto our website, scroll down, you'll see prayer support. We'd love to get people in touch with you and pray for you. We care about you. Also, if you're here this morning and something has stirred in you and you've decided to commit your life to Christ to make him king of your life, can I encourage you to shoot us an email at thecross at salemalliance.org or come and let us celebrate with you this Tuesday at White Ribbon Day. Today's benediction is actually an opportunity to receive blessing for healing. See, here at Salem Alliance, we believe that Jesus is still healer today. He heals those who he loves one of the ways that he shows his compassion and his love for his sons and his daughters. Before we offer that opportunity, I want to read a story of a healing that we recently received. And the story is from Jessica Mitchell. Jessica was our college pastor, and she's currently studying for ministry in New York City. And Jessica recently experienced something incredible. She writes, I wanted to pass on a healing story to you. I've experienced significant healing in a tailbone injury, and I am trusting for more. I fractured my tailbone in a snowboarding injury on New Year's Day. Great way to start 2020, I know. It's been a, long re a longer recovery than I anticipated, and it has been incredibly frustrating and discouraging injury. It's painful to sit down. I'm unable to exercise for the most part, and it's been rough on my sleep. I've felt stuck and discouraged over the past few months dealing with pain. Admittedly, during live stream, when we were asked if we needed prayer, I told God that I would just raise my hand because I didn't feel like standing up. I've been praying for healing for months, and I suppose you could say I've been fatigued or discouraged with praying and seeing no results. Eventually, though, I stood up and I put my hand on my tailbone as we prayed. That morning, it was particularly painful, but as soon as we began praying, I immediately felt a surge of heat on my lower back and the pain subsided. Being the skeptic that I am, I told God I would email in a few days once I knew for sure that I was healed. 
That night, I had my first pain-free night of sleep in four months. The next day, I was able to go on a 30-minute walk without feeling any pain. My pain while sitting down has noticeably been different. I was hesitant to submit this story since I am still experiencing some pain, but God has revealed a lot to me these past two days as I've prayed about it. First thing being, whether fully healed or partial, it's still clear that God's healing hand touched me, and that is worth celebrating. Secondly, God is growing me through this injury, and it might actually be a gift, this slow recovery. I've literally been forced to slow down and rely on God these past few months. As someone who appreciates the quick fix a high-intensity workout provides, my workout has instead been slowly stretching while praying. I'm forced to walk, not run. I've experienced such intimacy with God during my stretching time and walks. I truly feel like this injury is pruning me, slowing me down, and growing intimacy with Him. I am hopeful and persistent for full healing, yet I am also keeping my eyes open to what God is doing through healing. I am just as hopeful for an immediate miracle of healing as I am for deeper intimacy through slow healing. Whatever draws me closer, I am in. Jessica, thanks for sharing your story with us. And I want to invite those of you watching who are in need of healing to join Jessica, who I'm sure is standing wherever she is this morning, to stand and, and take a posture. And those of you who are in a room with others, if someone's standing, would you also extend your hand? Would you lay hands on them and join me as we pray for the Spirit to show up? Jesus, we declare that one of your names is Healer. And so we just thank you. We declare that you have healed in the past and you will heal again. I declare that you're my healer and that you have provided healing for me. And Lord, I pray that you would come now, that you would see your children, that you would see them standing, looking, anticipating, that you would see their posture and that you would bless them now, that you would extend, extend your hand of healing, not because of anything that they've done, but simply because you love them. Lord, I pray that you would continue to just heal people who are just experiencing a slow healing. Lord, would you bring that healing to completion? Lord, I pray for those struggling with neck pain. I pray for those who are in trouble with hearing, Lord. I pray for those who are dealing with a cough now, even those who maybe have symptoms with COVID and don't even know it. I pray that you would erase those from them in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for those who are battling with knee issues, for those who are dealing with, with just bruises, they don't even know what's happening, Lord. I just pray that you would heal those as well. Lord, I pray for those who are dealing with heel pain, and I pray your healing touch over them now in Jesus' name. Lord, I also pray for those who are experiencing just emotional or mental issues today. Lord, for those battling anxiety or depression, I pray that your healing hand would come and that you would touch them. For those battling insomnia, I pray incredible rest for them tonight as they lay down. Lord, may they experience great, deep, restful sleep tonight in Jesus' name. And for those who are struggling with a relational pain, Lord, I pray that you would bring reconciliation, that you would bring healing, that you would give the power to forgive, that you would just restore relationships as well. We declare that you are a God that heals and we love you. We thank you for your spirit. Come and do your work in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, thanks for being with us today. We hope that you'll join us again tonight for our live stream Pentecost worship night, seven o'clock. Hope to see you then. Grace and peace to you. Amen. Amen.